ahead and immediately thank the R. Scott Falk family, the Ashmani family, and Rebecca McDade for their support of tonight's program and the overall yes, series of What's Next. It's entirely digital. Uh, upcoming explorations will include cities and money. So come back for those. Those are big topics we all want to know more about. Exploration. Um, I have to tell you that our fall season at the festival is underway. Um, if you're new to the festival, this is the biggest time of year in terms of the programming we're doing. And we have lots of digital content, but we're also doing a lot of programming in person in Chicago, uh, running now all the way through early December. So go to chicagohumanities.org, take a look at all of the great programs that are coming up. And if you're in the city, please do join us. There's actually a ticket offer there right now, so take advantage of that and come out and see some great, great, great programs. So I think, um, oh, one more thank you to our captioner, Joe Gale, for captioning this program. We caption all of our programs. We're committed to accessibility. To so you can activate the closed captions right here in the YouTube environment. So go ahead and do that. Uh, and I think that's all of my notes. So let's uh, move on and, and turn to our fantastic panel. Um, we're very, uh, fortunate to have an acclaimed labor activist, the former chief economist in the US Department of Labor and a really celebrated Fortune 50 CEO, CEO joining us tonight. And when I was thinking about that, it was almost like the setup to that classic joke, you know, an economist, an activist <laughs> to a bar. I think it's actually a setup for a great conversation with all these different perspectives because I mean between the three of them we can go inside boardrooms and into the corporate world we can go within labor movements we can go inside government into data um, and really understand some of the big issues around work and there are so many of them so um, let me introduce our panelists Indra Nui was the first woman of color and immigrant to run a fortune 50 company which was PepsiCo she uh, rose to uh, CEO and chair of that company until her retirement just recently in 2019 she has not slowed down though she has a new book out this fall which is my life in full work family and our future welcome Indra good to be here thank you for having me Thank you. Aijin Pu is returning to the festival. She's been with us sure. a few times Welcome before. You. She is, of course, the co-founder and executive director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance and is also an author. Her book, The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America is a really good read. Welcome back, Aijin. Thanks so much for having me, Allison. Thank you. And finally, Harry Holzer is that former chief economist for the U.S. Department of Labor, and he's a professor of public policy at Georgetown University, where he also founded their Center on Poverty and Inequality. And his book is Where Did All the Good Jobs Go? I think that's right, which is a question a lot of us are asking. So as we all know, there are many big issues around work right now, acute labor shortages, uh, workplace safety issues, especially around COVID, um, exploitation of workers, anxiety about productivity, calls for labor reforms and efforts to you know, renegotiate the compact between employers and workers and, and really to reimagine work entirely. So I'm gonna start with a really simple, easy question. For all of you, um, are we witnessing an unprecedented disruption in what we've understood as work? Is this the end of work as we've known it? And Ijen, I'm going to have you start us off because you know you talk a lot about how domestic workers and their experiences really tell us a lot about the overall work economy. Mm -hmm. And then we'll end with Harry. So Ijen, take it away. Is work as we know it done? Uh... Let me say, <laughs> yes, no, <laughs> no, let me say that um, I represent a workforce that I call the, um, the original futurists, perhaps the original gig economy workers, um, because <laughs> the workforce of domestic workers, um, the nannies, the house cleaners, the home care workers who work inside of our homes, um, <laughs> have forever faced uh, conditions that are unpredictable, um, no access to a safety net, low wages, um, no job security, no clear job description, 
piecing together work, unpredictable hours, um, the conditions um, no of job domestic security. work that for a very long time were really on the margins and the edges of the economy are increasingly coming to define more and more of the experience of work in America. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons for that. And I think that it is inside of the margins and the shadows of our economy that we can both see, look into the future if we're not careful, and also look for the solutions that will help us reclaim the dignity of work and the security of work in America. And that's what my organization has been trying to do is innovate solutions, look for ways of reshaping our policies, our systems, the kinds of structural reforms that will allow us to reset the economy for this era, which is a very different era from when most of our labor laws and frameworks were put into place. We used to be a manufacturing-based economy. We're now a service-based economy. Used to be the dominant model was permanent full-time employment. No longer, depending on who you ask, up to 30-some percent of the workforce is self-employed, independent contractor, temporary, part-time, contingent work. So the non-traditional is becoming more and more the norm, and we need to rethink our structures so that we can actually restore a dignity and a quality of work for the 21st century. Thank you. Uh, Indra? Well, you know, I think work is the work. I mean, there's always going to be work. So work is never going to go away. I think the big question we're asking ourselves, especially coming out of the pandemic, which forced us to rethink where we're going to work from and what kind of tools we're going to use to connect are sort of four major questions. Who's going to do the work? Is it going to be so automated that robots are going to take away a lot of the work? Or does the work still require human intervention? A lot of what iGen is talking about is not going to be automated easily. The second is, how do you do the work? Do you do it um, remotely? Do you do it you know, with computers? Or do you have to be manually present to do the work? So how do you do the work? The third is, where do you do the work from? Do you do, do it from home or co-working space, or do you have to go into the office? And what do you get paid for the work? If you do it from home, do you get paid differently than if you come into work? If you do it in uh, Omaha versus New York, do you get paid differently? So I think we're at a very disruptive moment uh, in our workforce today. And I would argue that the disruption is more in office jobs than they are in the, work, the workers that Aijin Poo's talking about, because those people were needed through the pandemic the same way as they're gonna be needed going forward. Uh, and we need to solve for domestic workers very differently than these questions that I'm raising that apply to office workers and get to what really is the future of work for them. And so uh, I think this next year is gonna be sort of a confusing year where everybody tries to figure out how are we gonna shake out? Uh, so we ought to look at the next year as a period of experimentation, period where some people are gonna swing the pendulum back to everybody needs to come to work. Others are gonna say, stay home. And others are gonna experiment with in between models. So I'm eagerly looking to see how it's all gonna shake out. Thank you, Indra. Harry, what would you add? Well, um, I do think certainly there are going to be disruptive forces. Uh, automation will continue to replace a lot of jobs. Uh, although historically, for hundreds of years, going back to the Luddites, people have wondered if automation was going to wipe out work, and it never has. Uh, there are almost always new jobs created, new jobs to be done. Uh, we want to worry about the quality of those jobs and the pay and the skills they require. Um, uh, so that's one dimension. We, we know that the pandemic accelerated some automation that was going to happen anyway and some disruption that was going to happen anyway. Uh, the shift to remote work and, and out of all the possibilities that Indra mentioned, I think for a lot of professional managerial workers, it will be more of a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. uh, and there will be some mix of you know, three days in the office, two days at home, something like that. Of course, many, many jobs like the one I gen we're talking about do require your presence uh, at, at the work site. Then there's a different form, and I think Ijen was talking about more institutional shifts. 
and, and how work is defined. Uh, uh, gig workers, uh, uh, employers changing their workers into independent contractors. Now, I personally read those numbers uh, 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 as, as a little less dramatic than iGen described. And, you know, in iGen, you listed a whole bunch of categories that add up to about 30%, but I think part-time is, is the biggest chunk of those. And part-time is very, because we've always had part-time work, and, and a lot of people love part-time work, in <laughs> fact. Um, gig work, at least up till the pandemic, was only about 1%. It was mostly Uber and Lyft drivers. And, and now I think it's gone up because there's a lot more delivery of food going mm -hmm. on and, and things of that nature. So maybe it'll be two or 3%. So I, I don't think all these changes are, are really dramatic. Now, now there's other things that somehow under the radar we haven't talked about. Uh, there's an economist at, at Brandeis named David Weil. And he, he has talked about something called fissuring. And fissuring means... It's not that an employer turns all of their workers into independent contractors. They contract out the work function to other companies, mm -hmm. right? So under the same roof, and, and I, Andrew, I wouldn't be surprised if, if some of that occurred at Pepsi, and, and there's often good efficiency regions to do that. And that's a different, and by the way, we don't have good data on that. We don't know, but it, it, there's reason to believe that's not such a great bet for the worker in the long run, because the company for whom they now work has less incentive to invest in them and train them and, and do all these things. And, and you know, historically, companies that did, did well in the product market that had high profits shared them with almost every employee, uh, the, the secretary, the night watchman, the security guard. That doesn't happen in a fissured workplace where under the same roof, people don't work for that company anymore. Yeah. And so, so that's the kind of institutional change that we haven't even measured well and haven't gotten a handle on. So I would say there is going to be disruption, both automated disruption and institutional disruption. It has already been occurring. The pandemic accelerated some of it. Uh, and by the way, the pandemic, even though we're recovering from the pandemic, it created some long lasting problems, you know, 5 million workers either permanently let go or out of the labor force, et cetera. Um, but to me, it's, it is more a matter of degree. Uh, work is not over. The employment relationship is not over. And I don't think we want to be distracted by that kind of over drama because we have serious problems to worry about uh, in terms of equity, in terms of fairness, in terms of giving workers the supports they need. I Jen mentioned the dignity of work, to me, a very important concept. So, and, and I don't want overly dramatic descriptions of disruption to, to take our attention away. It, th those things matter, but so do these other issues. Uh, and we want to we want to sort of keep the right focus on all of them. And Jen, did you want to respond before I ask another question? Well, sure. Um, a couple of things. Uh, I agree with, um, with a lot of what's been laid out. Um, one is that I think that it is true that we don't actually know how it will all shake out. But we do know that before there was a pandemic, there was an epidemic of low wage work in America where you had so many people working incredibly hard and still not able to make ends meet, still not able to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. So that fundamentally has to be addressed. Right. And secondly, that even though there is so much that we don't know, there are some things that we do know which is that, for example, there will be a need for in-person service work like care work, for example. We live in a country where 10,000 people are turning 65 every single day and people are living longer because of advances in health care. Mm -hmm. We need more care than ever before because we've essentially added an entire generation onto our lifespan mm -hmm. in this country. And these jobs, care jobs, consistently, home care in particular, consistently one of the top three fastest growing occupations in the entire labor market because mm -hmm. of the demand. And the average annual income is $18,000 per year. Mm. So I think that, and many economists are predicting that because of the huge need for care, if you take child care and elder care jobs combined, care jobs could be the largest occupation in the entire labor market in the United States. Again, jobs that can't be outsourced or automated, at least 
until we develop an algorithm for empathy. Um, and so, you know, we could say, okay, there's a lot we don't know about the future of work, like most things about the future. But what mm -hmm. we do know is that we can make these jobs good jobs with living wages and benefits and economic security. And let's lean in there. Indra, I wonder, I, in response to what Harry and Ijen have just laid out, because I, I was thinking about this, so there's the logistics of work and, and all of that, like who and how and where and when and everything that are being disrupted and rethought. There are these big structural changes you've all just talked about, sort of the overall organization of work and the sectors of work. But what you've also been talking about is sort of this existential reckoning right, with the, the terms of work and the issues of equity um, and, and the connections between workers, the workers who care yeah. for children or elderly and enable workers who work in other sectors to work, right? So there's this like, we're inter interdependent. Do you see that reckoning happening with these kinds of terms of work within corporate circles, um, you know, whether when you were at Pepsi, but more broadly, you have, you know, I know you're on the, the board of Amazon, like, so you have a lot of different views on into different processes. So one of the things that puzzles me is, you know, going back to what Ajahn was just saying, as you look at all the caregivers, caregivers of children of aging people, whenever we talk about their wages and how, um, you know, low they are, why they're not even at living wage, for one person, leave alone a family of two or three, I don't get a rise out of people. People don't react to it and say, oh my God, we have to do something about it. I think it's because the wage rates of these people are always, have always been compared to the unpaid work that women did over the years. So they look at it versus unpaid work and say, boy, $18,000, where are we gonna come up with it? Or $20,000 because we had this huge unpaid workforce, a uh, lifelong unpaid workforce. Now that unpaid workforce is saying, no, we want to go into paid work ourselves, have the power of the purse. We want economic freedom. We're getting college degrees. We want to rise in our jobs. So we have a shortage of uh, people that have been taken up by people who are undocumented in some cases, people who have not gone to college, people who have to work within a certain radius. People are really uh, struggling to get jobs, take up these care jobs. We don't provide adequate training. We don't give them a pathway to move up. And as Ai Poo said, the wage rates are low. I think we need to have a discussion about coming to terms with why is it we entrust our most vulnerable children and seniors to people who get paid the least, who don't have a safety net themselves. Because many of these caregivers, I noticed during the pandemic when I was co-chairing Reopen Connecticut, they have children. They have uh, senior people to take care of, family members. They leave them in charge of other people to whom they pay even less because they can't afford it. And during the pandemic, they came to work and had to stay with the family for two or three weeks. Couldn't even see their families. And nobody thought about all this when we talked about care and support for these frontline workers. So I think we are at a moment of reckoning where we shouldn't have to have a pandemic to decide how to support this large workforce that keeps us, keeps our quality of life moving, especially with 10,000 people turning 65 every day. And uh, my real concern is that if more and more people dropped out of that workforce, I think we are in for really tough times. I mean, robots are great, but robots are not gonna take care of me and give me a hug uh, when I really need it, when I'm a kid or a senior citizen. So as I age, I worry about this, Alison. I'm being very nice to my kids, but I really worry about this. I don't think robots are gonna run humanities festivals either. I don't think, but maybe I'm wrong. I mean, you probably uh, I hope them. not, yeah. But yeah, so where do we, I mean, maybe one place we could think about is like, so obviously there's this need for change. These are longstanding issues, chronic issues. They long predate the pandemic. And it's just, yeah, the idea that everyone's, wages have kept up with, or even were fair from the start with what it costs to live is, is a big issue. So I'm just curious to maybe turn to policy for a minute, and then I want to come back to how all of you got interested in that work as your work, you know, but 
Um, we have the reconciliation spending and the infrastructure bills um, that could potentially have a big impact on some of the issues we're talking about. I mean, Ijen, you've made clear that the proposed investment in the home care sector is something that will impact all of us if it's done right. So what do you think? I mean, I know we're in this sort of another limbo, like what's going to happen with all of this, but what's your take? Are, are the proposals in there going to have a really a good impact on some of these issues? Um, and what's the likelihood that we're going to get all of this through? Um, uh, where should I go first? How about, um, Harry, why don't you start us off and then I, Jen, and then Indra. Okay, um, so in terms of the last conversation, uh, uh, we all agree that these care workers, they're very important uh, and they should be paid more. The question is, but how are we going to accomplish that? Mm -hmm. uh, and what policy tools? Some people say jack the minimum wage up to at least $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. I have some concerns about doing that at the federal level because I think it will spur more rapid automation in a lot of sectors and, and, and it would give employers, and especially there's a lot of low wage uh, regions in America, rural areas, small towns where the median wage already is not much above 15. So I, I worry about just doing it purely through government mandate. Mm -hmm. And other people say, well, let's unionize all these workers. That would be great, except right now the unionism, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, unionism is, has been declining in America and the private sector since 1955. I mean, it's been a, a, a near 70-year decline, only 6%. And, and that's a complicated issue. Only 6% of the private sector is unionized, so I'm skeptical that that will be the issue. I do think there are some levers that, that the Biden administration is proposing through its procurement policies and its procurement rules and the standards mm. uh, that have to be met. I, and I think that that's a decent. But if we take a step back and say, okay, what, what are the broader problems that have been leading to cause these sort of stagnant, low and stagnant wages and poor benefits and, and mm -hmm. the things that, that both Andrew and I Jen have described. Mm -hmm. and, and there's been this kind of almost mindless debate among economists between the economists at skills, it's education and training versus my friends more, my progressive friends, the left saying, you know, it's about power. Uh, and it's, to me, it's clear it's about both. Uh, so to me, a, a sustained program uh, uh, to improve compensation of workers has to start with skills and productivity and, and how do we improve the education and the training? How do we give workers more access to good training programs at community colleges? How do we incentivize employers to actually invest more in their workers? Um, but it is about power. And, 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 you know, part of the reason employer power has gone up is because uh, Technology and globalization have given them a lot more places to go if they want to avoid high-priced labor, right? They can automate, they can relocate, they can offshore or outsource. Um, but they also, they've developed a degree of monopoly power that we shouldn't accept. You know, a lot of these mergers of companies, which do give those employers more monopoly, we call it monopsony power, that enable them to pay lower wages than they might have to in a more competitive market. All these non-compete agreements, all these non-disclosure agreements uh, that really limit, you know, the functioning of, of a good competitive market to the employer's advantage. So, you know, I, I, there's a whole set of policies around education and training that are mm -hmm. very important that we want to talk about. Uh, there are a set of policies around enhancing, if not worker power, at least worker voice and worker sharing the fruits of, of automation uh, and, and, and some of those things, you know, if we can't unionize workers, at least give them some voice through, in Europe, they call them works councils, you know, ways for, for workers to directly share decision-making. I would put some workers on corporate boards uh, for sure. Uh, I would encourage a lot more profit sharing because when workers have profit sharing, they actually, it's not a, in, in a world where, you know, robots are capital, right? More and more, of the returns to production are going to go to the owners of the robots. I'd like to see workers getting a bigger slice of, of those returns to capital. And I think the government can encourage that. Uh, and there's a whole different set of employer practices that some of us call high road policies. Uh, rather than taking the lowest road, you know, reducing wages and benefits the least possible, there's ways of companies investing in their workers 
not only paying them more wages and benefits, but, but more training, more upward mobility prospects, more profit sharing. And it turns out there's, there have been some studies that show that companies can be as productive and as profitable if they take that high road. And, you know, and, and some of the companies that get kicked around, I mean, I, I know Southwest Airlines is one of your sponsors here, but you know, there's a set of companies like Southwest, Costco that have gotten famous, but even Walmart, we used to kick Walmart around as a terrible, terrible employer in retail. Walmart decided they couldn't attract and retain good workers. They mm-hmm. made a conscious decision to start being a better employer and to raise wages and benefits. And, 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 and I know others have done that too. This is an example that I'm, I talk to them a lot and they really think it's paying off in terms of their ability to attract and retain more productive workers. So that's what we want to focus on. You know, how do we improve productivity? How do we make sure that these workers share? How do they get the skills they need, but making sure they they have some voice and some sharing uh, in in the benefits of this economy? Whether these two bills are going to create it, I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I find it interesting that, you know, the $1 trillion bipartisan bill uh, the infrastructure is going to create a lot of new demand for construction and manufacturing workers. There's almost nothing in that bill to train workers to do that. Uh, mm-hmm. And I worry that if the 3.5 becomes something more like 2. Point something, which a, a couple of famous senators say they're going to insist on, I worry that things like job training will, will mm-hmm. be chopped because they don't have the same powerful constituency and popularity. So um, a lot of things to do if we want to make it a reality that yeah. all these workers share in the benefits of a more productive economy. Right, I, but just I have a question of, for clarification. Let's say that in the most rural part of the country, uh, somebody paid $15 an hour, I'm just running the math. And if somebody worked 40 hours, they make $600 a week or $31,200 a year. Would $31,000 be a good living wage? Uh, or it would be a high wage in rural America. I don't know. Well, yeah. So first of all, these are places where the cost of living is much lower. It would not be a good wage in San Francisco or Seattle or New York City. Uh, in, in many small towns, rural areas, uh, it is not a bad wage. Second, and the whole thing, a lot of these families do have multiple workers. I understand there are uh-huh. single this, parents okay. out there. But, you know, the living wage concept kind of always assumes one worker. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, and, and remember, that's a minimum. That's a minimum, you know, yeah. but I worry about going, you know, like I would favor the federal government setting a few different federal minimum wages, mm-hmm. one for the kind of biggest, most expensive metro areas, and maybe something a little lower for, for the smaller uh, towns, the rural areas where cost of living is lower, where prices are lower. Um, uh-huh. So there's, there's a lot of ways to do this. Mm-hmm. But still keeping in mind good economics, that if you make things too expensive, people and employers buy less of it. And, and mm-hmm. if we raise wages, let's do it through higher Absolutely. productivity of workers yep. and, and, and making sure they share in that higher productivity. Hi, Jen, what's your take on the bills and, and sort of what um, Harry's laid out? The government can do some things, it can't do everything, business should be doing things. There's lots of different actors here. What, what's your take on all of this? Um, well, I think the President's Build Back Better agenda is actually incredibly transformative um, for a few different reasons. I mean, even as a candidate uh, for president, he announced his economic agenda. and, Mm. um, And for the first time in history, candidate for president of the United States had the investing in caregiving as a core pillar of his economic agenda. Not the women's agenda, not the family agenda, the economic agenda. And what the Build Back Better Act that Congress is debating right now uh, includes is big investments in childcare, paid family and medical leave, and home and community-based care for the growing aging population and people with disabilities. And with those investments, take the home and community-based service investment, for example. It's explicitly about expanding access to services for people who need it in the home and community and raising wages and improving the quality of jobs in the home care workforce. And it would represent the single largest investment that would directly benefit women of color workers in the history of the United States. Mm 
Mm. And not to mention the fact that this very workforce of home care workers was one of two groups of workers excluded from the New Deal in the 1930s mm. because Southern Dixiecrats refused to support the labor policies if they included equal protections for farm workers and domestic workers who were Black at the time. Mm. So the fact that we are talking about building back better, how do we reset our economy for the next era? And then jobs investment, yes, includes a more traditional infrastructure jobs investment, jobs that will, by the way, mostly go to men. And the Build Back Better Act includes a big investment in child care workers and home care workers, making those jobs good jobs, and the secondary benefit of enabling working parents and working family caregivers to go back to work because they have access to care for their families. And I don't need to remind everybody that there were millions of women who were pushed out of the workforce in the pandemic because of caregiving challenges. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This will enable them to go back to work. And so I don't know how many people really realize just how transformative these investments can be, both for the workers in the care sector, but also for all of us who need care in yeah. order to go to work. Like some people need a road and a bridge to get to work and other people need care <laughs> to get to work. And this bill, this budget actually invests in that. And shout out, since we're in Illinois, shout out to Senator Duckworth, who's been a real champion on the home care, the HCBS and home care investment in Build Back Better. Um, but you know, it's it's it really truly is has transformative potential. Mm. It's interesting. Our our other senator from Illinois, Tammy Duckworth, was with us. Senator Duckworth was with us last week talking about these very same issues that you're laying out and the the you know we that argument that. Um, we cannot be competitive overall if we don't invest in families, invest in women, invest in the people who care for children or the elderly. Well, that's who I meant to shout out as Senator Duckworth. She, yeah. she's, she's been a real champion. I, I guess, you know, it made me, I was thinking, like I said, are you frustrated with the pace of change? And I have to ask you, Indra, I mean, reading your story about when you came into work and, you know, you were one of a very few women and one of a very few people of color, particularly in these leadership roles, and that's changed incredibly. But in terms of recognizing, again, the, the terms, the value, the kind of existential questions around work, is business doing enough? And is it more of a solution to these problems than to government, than government might be? I mean, what's the role of business here? I think large companies are beginning to realize they should do something. In PepsiCo, we had on-site and near-site childcare in many facilities. Uh, employees paid for it. Uh, but, you know, we needed to evolve into one where there's some sort of a sliding scale where people with lower pay pay little or nothing at all or get a subsidy, and people on the higher pay ranges pay the full cost of the childcare. Um, as Ajahn Poo said, this is an essential service. And I think it's very important that when you set up a care infrastructure, we look at it as a utility. It's a necessary utility to support families, necessary utility to support women to enter the paid workforce. Don't look at it as a regular cash stream that you can monetize and float in the public market and make a lot of money going public with childcare systems. That's not the way it should work. A childcare system or a senior care citizen, a senior care home is a utility, a good utility taking care of the vulnerable population. So the whole thinking behind care has to change. And in many ways, my book is about that. It talks about how you can't talk about women coming up the management layers if in the early layers of management, they don't have childcare support. And clearly coming out of the pandemic, you cannot ignore the pleas of the frontline workers who struggled to keep us all going without a care infrastructure to support them. So I think, I hope in this moment of stillness coming out of the pandemic, people have internalized this issue enough to say we better do something about it as opposed to saying, well, the pandemic is done, we won't have another one for 100 years, so why, why worry about it? The, again, again, the issue is we are comparing them to the unpaid women who used to do the job. 
I, I mean, it's an interesting idea to think of care as a public good and how do we invest in that so it supports all workers. I think that's very, um, very interesting. But I, I have a follow up for you, which is essentially like thinking about, um, you know, some of the response to these bills that, and the transformations from small business. And I was thinking about this, Harry, when you were talking earlier, like maybe we could have different minimum wages um, depending where you live. But what about mm -hmm. the guys? Because I think there's a lot of pushback and division from small business owners and the costs of some of these, the costs either of increasing wages or even in, in this moment where we have these uh, shortages, not because we don't have people, but people want different conditions of work. And yeah. mm -hmm. we're saying, I can't do this. I don't wanna do this and I don't support this. Well, you know, I think um, there is a limit. So, so by the way, I, I you know, I, uh, I support the things that I, Jen and, and Indra just said, you know, about care, mm -hmm. spending much more on child care, much more robust policies for paid family leave, standards, making sure those people uh, are paid more. But, but that remains, uh, a sort of, you know, those are important issues. And by the way, they're, they are some of the reasons why female labor force in America has, has fallen behind yep. you know, participation in almost all other parts of the world. That's important. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it, it's not, you know, there's many, many other sectors and issues we, we have to worry about. I, I have some sympathy for small businesses who, who say we're getting regulated to death. And, you know, there's a, there's a tendency for, you know, we pile on new regulations as new problems come up and, you know, climate and safety and uh, financial regulation, all those things makes sense, we, but we never, like the level of regulation kind of rises and rises and it is burdensome to some small business owners. Uh, and again, if you make labor too expensive, make it too hard. And by the way, states who do that run the risk of seeing employers cross the border to other, to more of these rural states or, or places where there's less of that. So, you know, there's a limit to how much we can do through pure mandates alone on small business. But I think, Making, you know, technical subsidies and tax credits and technical assistance for the companies that do the right thing, you know, for more training. And by the way, you know, we talked about automation and disruption. Mm -hmm. I would, I'm not averse to a modest or moderate tax every time automation displaces a worker. I don't support a robots tax. But, you know, it, it's not a crazy idea, and we've already done it in some ways in our unemployment insurance system that, you know, if, if a company permanently dislocates a worker and replaces them with a robot, maybe they should pay something for that because it doesn't yeah. pose a big cost. And then and we can take that money and subsidize the retraining mm -hmm. that needs to be done. But, you know, there's many things we could do on the tax credit side and the technical assistance side to help companies do the right thing. But again, as long as we make clear to them, this will raise your worker productivity. It won't be coming necessarily out of your pocket or out of your shareholder pockets for, for public companies. And I think that's the right way to think about this. How do, how do we raise everybody's productivity and then make sure all workers are sharing, which they are not right now. I mean, we know a much bigger slice has been going to the owners of capital and even within workers, you know, the median wage has been more or less stagnant for the last yeah. four years, except for a few short time periods. Um, that's unacceptable. It's unacceptable when, when, you know, when productivity is, is rising. So that's, it's a twin challenge. Yeah, Higher I productivity and, and, and more sharing and, and, and uh, more voice for workers in that whole arrangement. I want to ask about the voice workers. We actually, we uh, got a couple of questions and I invite everyone to share your questions in the YouTube chat and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can before the program ends. But one of them is speaking to something you're just raising right now and I'd love to hear from you, Ijen, which is that, um, you know, in essence, it's sort of that dramatic difference between those at the top who are, what their wage looks like and those in these, um, in at the, the bottom in a sense. Um, and, uh, and someone saying, you know, people getting paid well for poor results has to stop. The system has no incentives. What do you think about that idea? I mean, you're trying to talk about incentives, Harry, for, you know, to encourage productivity and workers share the profits, share the wealth. I, Jen, what, where do, what do you think about this observation that we don't have the right incentives right now for people to try and do just that? 
I mean, I think that that's true. I think that, look, everything that um, Silicon Valley has driven in terms of tech innovation has been designing for efficiency and convenience for a middle class consumer. And I think that that's really important. And I certainly personally have benefited from it enormously. And I think we ha there are no incentives to innovate towards greater equity and opportunity. And, um, and I think that it's time we did that and long overdue, as a matter of fact. And this question that Harry raised earlier about, um, about worker power is really, really important because, I mean, even the conversation about the future of work, thousands of conversations um, in rooms around the country about how robots are displacing jobs and how automation is going to change everything and mm. all of these conversations and not a single working class person in them. <laughs> You know, when do workers get to be a part of the conversation about the future of work? And isn't it more about the future of workers than it is about the future of work? We are talking about human beings. Our society cannot function without human beings who contribute and can see a return, a value that the that actually can benefit from the productivity that they offer. And, and, I, and I will say that I think that there are lots of creative models that are being developed now and we need to supercharge them. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, standards boards, wage boards, ways to give workers a seat at the table together with employers and local governments to set health and safety standards, for example, in the context of a pandemic. I think those mechanisms are really important. We've just launched a pilot program with a company called Handy, which um, dispatches house cleaners um, through an online platform in Indiana, Kentucky, and Florida, where the company has raised the base pay mm -hmm. of handy workers to $15 an hour, mm -hmm. plus they're paying in uh, to paid time off that is accrued um, for every hour worked on the handy platform, and they're paying for occupational accident insurance. And we believe that, the comp that that is good for that company's business and that ultimately they will actually find tremendous value in those investments that they're making in the people who are working on their platform. And every month the company meets with a group of handy pros, the workers on the platform, you have decision makers in the company actually meeting with a group of workers to talk about how to make mm -hmm. the ex worker experience on the platform better. And that kind of we have to be driving towards that. <laughs> those kinds of mechanisms, those kinds of experiments, those initiatives are not going to happen on their own. Um, and so the more incentives we offer, the better. And some of it's going to have to be mandated, too. In, uh, I mean, one of the ways that workers have historically been part of the mix is through unions, through organized labor. And there mm -hmm. are analyses of the proposals that it would make it more possible for workers to organize. What role do you think unions play in trying to make some of these changes happen? I mean, unions bring scale to an issue, unified voice, and they fight for an issue. Um, if companies address those issues on their own, you don't need a union. It's when the pact between companies and the workers is frayed, you need a union to represent union uh, issues. So, I mean, labor issues. So I think it's high time companies sat down and said, I, I agree with Harry. We don't want more regulation, Harry. Absolutely not. It's punishing. Uh, you know, it just it's cumbersome. It's bureaucratic. We don't want more regulation. But I think companies have to understand um, that workers are not there doing us a favor. You know, the workers are not here saying, let me just do you a favor. They're actually working for the job they're doing and they're getting very little money. And I often tell people, put yourself in that job. Assume your son or daughter is doing that job. How do you feel about the wages they get in the working conditions? We should not look at these workers as if they are workers that we don't really care about. They're not in my reference set. 
It doesn't matter how wealthy you are, they have to be in your reference set because they're in your home, they're in your rooms, they're in your meals. And somehow we have to bring that thought into their heads and their hearts. And I find that missing when I talk to people. And that's what worries me the most. Aijin, you can bring the people into the boardrooms. You can do whatever you want there. It only sets up a uh, contentious relationship between everybody. What we're talking about is not taking the wages from 40,000 to 45,000. We're talking about paying some of these people a little better than, you know, they don't even make as much as grocery store clerks who don't make much either. We're asking to just bring them up to some living wage. That's what we're talking about. Right, care workers, other workers also who are not being paid enough to live. I mean, you look at retail and there's the, that's the story in a lot of scenarios. I guess, you know, to me, I, it's, it speaks to your heart. It also speaks to democracy, right? How we treat yeah. them um, has a lot to do with the health and vibrancy of our democracy and whether we can come together. And I'm curious to hear all of you. So we do need, we have unions, we have workers, we have um, nonprofits, we have for-profits, we have government. How do we bring these people to, how do we create these alliances to understand this as a kind of uh, issue that affects all of us somewhere along the, the supply chain, so to speak? Um, so first of all, I just want to address the union issue again. I support what's called the PRO Act. Um, a bill that's already passed by the House of Representatives, because you can really can make a case that, that the landscape created by the National Labor Relations Act has gotten so tilted in favor of employers, and they, they, so many of them know how, some of them outright break that law because it's not well enforced, or know how to walk right up to the line, uh, uh, but, but still make it really hard to discourage workers from voting. Uh, it's not going to happen. And, and by the way, uh, we, we probably do need to do some reforms in the in the filibuster uh, before any of these you know, positive legislation. We can't do it all through reconciliation. Uh, um, you know, it, it's it's not going to happen. But you know, again, I I'm pessimistic about unions because of so many other changes that give employers. So we have to be creative about a how are workers going to share in the voice and, and get the skills. We, we've spoken very little tonight about education and training and we've under, under emphasized that issue. It's very, very important for workers. We're in an economy where, edu where skills earn a high premium. So I, I wanna make sure that's on the table. But again, it's, it's about incentivizing, you know, convincing employers that they can actually do well, maybe even do better. Like I said, Walmart learned that it's the company's better off when their workers are treated better and, and making that clear, creating mechanisms, whether they are the kind of the wage and standards boards that iGen talked about. And, and remember, you can't force companies. Companies can, they can, if they don't like it, they can automate even more. They can relocate. They can outsource even more of their work. Yeah. The whole company can go overseas, you know? So again, you, you got it make it in the interests of the company as well. And some mandates are necessary, but, but it's again, uh, you know, getting, it's coming up with ways where uh, you incentivize companies to earn their, to, to, to generate their best productivity uh, through worker empowerment uh, mm -hmm. and, and worker training and things like that. Um, and, and how to do that. And, you know, what are the right mechanisms? How much of it is, tax credits or technical assistance versus other met versus regs and mandates versus other things. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, the president could use more of the bully pulpit and he could, and, and I think, I think Biden has done more of this already than other presidents, but I he say a lot more saying we believe it's best for the American economy and for American business to improve the quality of these jobs and to create upward promotion ladders uh, and, and, and we are going to reward companies who do that. We're going to help companies do that. And, and that could maybe even change the whole conversation. But, but again, but we got to make it in countries, companies' interests, and they got to see their interests in order to get them to be willing to do that. It's just hard. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead and I'll come in. Um, well, Harry, I was just going to say that um, 
I agree with you. I also support the PRO Act. I think it's really important that we strengthen mm -hmm. the right, the fundamental right of workers to be able to come together and bargain collectively for better working conditions. I do believe that the conversation, not tonight, but as a whole, has really been dominated by the conversation, though, about upskilling, upskilling the worker, retraining, training. And I don't think we talk enough about how are we upgrading the jobs. Mm, and I agree. We, I, and I we agree. Have, we have this really unique opportunity. We've all just been clapping for essential workers. So many of these essential workers were completely invisible to us before. We took them for granted, yeah. the grocery workers, the delivery workers, the care workers. It turns out we're, we've all realized now that they are essential to our safety, to our health. And most of them earn minimum wage. <laughs> and, and we can do something about that. Right. But, but it's, it's a false it's not... choice. It's a false choice to say, you know, we, we need we need good jobs Absolutely. and we need good workers. Right. And, and we got to improve. And, and by the way, and, and, and the best thing we can do for some of those workers is maybe help them train for another sector uh, where, where the job opportunities are better. Oh, and then employers will have to fight a little harder to keep them. And, you know, one of the best one of the best things happening right now is workers have become choosier coming out of the pandemic. It's tightening mm -hmm. the a labor, a tight labor market is a great friend of workers because it makes employers fight harder. So if we make it easier for some of those workers in those low wage jobs to upskill and go somewhere else, it would put pressure on those employers mm -hmm. to treat them better, I think. And, and that's part of the equation, too, I think. Yeah, I but agree. It's, it's not choice, either or. Yeah. It's not either or. It's both right. for sure. Right. Kinder, would you would you support the PRO Act? I don't know. I don't know the details of the PRO Act. I have to get into it and I will tonight. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we don't wait another four or five years where we upskill these people and then come to a labor shortage, which causes them to get paid more. The care wage increase has to happen now. And look, I'm not simply asking for wage increases. I'm just worried about the care equation. I just worry about childcare, which is taking a lot of women out of the workforce when, when we need people in the workforce. And I'm very worried about senior care. If people don't show up to take care of our elders, that's not gonna be a good thing. And so I worry about the human side of this whole thing, not necessarily the long-term issues, which we, we have to worry about, Harry, as a policy person, you have to worry about putting the foundation in right. right. But I'm very worried about the number of people who have left their jobs in the pandemic and that we have a labor shortage. But I think a labor shortage can be something that incentivizes good things to happen and companies to, you know, in, in a really tight labor market, for instance, companies can't afford in a lot of cases to say, oh, I'm just not going to look at anyone that has a criminal record. Right? They can't afford to, to uh, ignore yeah. that source of talent. So I, I think a tight labor market can be something that helps us get companies to do more of the right thing. Uh, uh, and, yeah. and, and that's good. And I'll say one more thing about the care thing that hasn't come up. There have been some studies recently that show that the quality of care gets a lot better when these workers are paid somewhat better. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and, and there's a return in the form of, of, of less sickness for the elderly being taken care of. And, yeah. and you know, the, the quality of care improves the government. Is, so, so the country gets a return on that as well, which is one more reason to support iGen's, the agenda that she has laid out, I think, for these workers. I just wanted to say, um, we got a couple of comments, I'd say somewhat skeptical in the audience that are interesting. One about the question of is 32,000 enough for rural workers to live on, or is it that we devalue rural work? So thinking again about what kind of work do we value? What kind do we not? And then mm -hmm. go ahead, answer Indra, and then I'll share the other one. No, no, I'm, go ahead. I, the, the question is the right one. I think workers, you, we have to look at the wages in the context of where they live, but we can't make them so uh, immobile because you're, only getting, you're getting paid to be in rural America. Therefore, you cannot leave that place. That's not the intent. So we have to think about this issue very, very carefully. 
But go ahead with the question. Yeah, yeah, the other is just a comment too that there needs to be more studies and maybe Ijen or Harry, you have thoughts about this, about why people are paid more or less state to state for the same work it, and arguing that it's, it's, it's more than just cost of living differences, that there's other kinds of structural issues here. So maybe you want to speak to that. I, I think uh, <laughs> some of it is in the, some of it is in the, um, education and training of the workers. Uh, some of it is in the legislation. I mean, red states and blue states politically are very different in the kinds of sports available to workers and more regulation in some of those places. So I think it's a mix of, of a combination of sort of demographic factors, industry factors, and policy and institutions as well. Um, we have a, a, f a few minutes left, so I want to get a couple more questions in before we wrap up. Um, I guess one is we've been talking a lot about labor and labor movements, and I know a lot of people and, and the value of work, a lot of people are keeping their eyes on what's happening with um, IATSE, which is the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. So not just the, also our entertainment, there's all this hidden labor and the possibility of that, like every, probably everything we enjoy in life, there are, there's a hidden story. Yeah. Of, it. Um, what other things are you, as we look toward these big transformations, what are you watching? What should we keep our eyes on? What should we be paying attention to? You know, um, Harry, you talked about like uh, fissuring, you know, outsourcing people mm. processes. What other things should we be looking at and caring about and getting engaged with if we want to transform work? Um, Ijen, I'll start with you. I do think that we need to raise wages um, because there are too many people who uh, cannot make a living despite how hard they're working. And so we have to raise wages. And I think we need to think about our safety net uh, and whether or not it actually keeps people safe. The fact that we don't have paid family and medical leave, the fact that 82% of domestic workers didn't have a single paid sick day going into the pandemic. The fact that so many workers fall outside of the mm. un um, unemployment insurance framework. Mm -hmm. So there, there's just a, an updating that we need to make in our safety net and our social contract through the lens of the 21st century worker, um, which is obviously a very diverse lens. And, and I think that we have to recognize that our workforce is a very different workforce than it was when we first put our structures into place and mm. more women working to Indra's point, um, uh, more diverse, even people with disabilities have been rely on home and community based services oh. to work and can work if they mm -hmm. have the supports and we need to be able to we need to invest in that um, for this next period. We have like one minute left. Harry, what would you say we keep our eyes on? Um, education and training on many different dimensions. Uh, the kinds of supports that, that I, Jen, and Indra have both talked about. Um, I prefer that they be pro-work supports. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in favor of the, the big increase in the child tax credit. I think that's an important anti-poverty mechanism. But what some people see as its cousin, which would be universal basic income for everybody, I, I tend to not support. Mm -hmm. I think that would just make it too easy for people to leave the workforce altogether. Mm -hmm. Let's struggle with, the, with these low wage jobs and make them better jobs, not give people a hammock that, that's more attractive than the workplace in many, many ways. So, so skills, supports, worker voice, but not the kinds of things like universal basic income that I think would take us in the wrong direction and, and which the taxpayer isn't willing to pay for anyway, so. And Indra, how would you, how would you wrap us up? What things should we be keeping our eyes on? I think that at some point very soon, the whole care equation has to come into our consciousness as perhaps one of the most critical uh, infrastructure jobs for the country. Just as we talk about Teach for America and getting the best and brightest there for a year or two, there should be a whole Care for America core where young people do the caregiving for a year or two to just get the whole profession lifted and to develop a greater sense of sensitivity and sensibility in 
young people's uh, heads that these jobs are backbone jobs for the country and for the citizenry to be uh, you know thriving in the future so i worried about i worry about child care and i worry about senior care it's a lovely word care but sort of we I take it as warm and fuzzy word and made it a liability. Well, we're looking to you to bring the care back. To <laughs> the care. Yeah, because that was one of the comments too. How do we get people in power to care about these issues? So um, thank you for giving us a lot of different things to think about around that equation. Indra Nui, Harry Holzer, and Ai-Jen Pu. It's just been a delight, a pleasure, and really informative to be talking with you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us at the Chicago Humanities Festival. Thank you, Alison. Thank, Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Ajin.